you think of someone who has integrity, when you, when you think of anyone in government who has integrity, when you think of anyone in government who has compassion, you have to think of Pierre Howard. He is a good man. He is a good Lieutenant Governor. He is my friend, and ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Lieutenant Governor Pierre Howard. Well, Tom, uh, thank you very much for those words, and uh, you and I have worked together in government since 1974. And I want to wish you the very best in your new endeavors. I know this group is sorry to uh, be losing you for the time being, but uh, we all wish you well. And I can't think of anyone that I had rather have say something nice about me, particularly in this group, than you. Uh, I'm proud to be your friend. Let's give him a hand for all he's done for the Public Policy Foundation. <laughs> Also, would like to uh, congratulate you on your choice of Griff Doyle. I, I hope this won't hurt you out here in this uh, in this group, Griff. But uh, to to say publicly that uh, you and I have been friends for about 20 years, and that uh, I've always considered you to be not only a friend but a supporter, uh, even when I didn't have very many. And so uh, it, it is a wonderful thing to uh, know that you're going to be working with the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. I wish you the very best in that. Um, Thank you uh, to the Senators Hill and Purdue and Marable and Reagan for being here this morning. And uh, I hope that some of you who don't know them will have a chance to meet them before you leave. I'm very proud of the State Senate. And I realize from looking at the polls that uh, most people in the state, while they hold their own legislator in pretty high regard, they hold the institution of the legislature in very low regard. And uh, you know, from some of the things that have happened, I can understand. But I wish that you would uh, take time to meet some of our state senators because I think when you, when you meet them and get to know them that you might have an entirely different perspective uh, on the state senate. And uh, I believe and uh, I know that good things are happening in the state senate. Uh, Louis Massey, who is uh, my right hand and my left hand, is here this morning. Uh, Louis, would you mind standing up? Stand up. So I, I want uh, you to know Louis. Lewis Massey from Gainesville, who ran my campaign. He was another protege of Tom Perdue. And um, he came and ran my campaign uh, after working for Governor Harris. He now runs my office. The, the reason I want you to get to know him is, number one, I might want you to vote for him sometime about 10 years from now. Number two, um, if you need anything, he's the guy to call. If I'm not available, uh, he's the guy to call. He's on. On, on the job all the time, and if I'm in a meeting or out somewhere, where he's a guy who can help me. I want to say one more word about uh, something else before I get into my speech. I want to thank Publix for coming to Georgia. Uh, I have gotten to know this company over the past uh, maybe year and a half, Clayton. Uh, Clayton Hollis, who's become a very close friend of mine uh, uh, through a lot of things we've done together, and. The Jenkins family, uh, such a great uh, uh, public family. They've helped Emory University so much, and they've built such a great company. I just wish I could buy stock. But uh, anyway, uh, coming to Georgia was a wonderful decision for us. And uh, it's always uh, great to have another caring, uh, concerned corporate citizen like Publix. So uh, Charles, thank you for this this morning. and. And thank you for coming to Georgia. And we look forward to the opening of the Buckhead store, which I think is uh, what next this week or next week. This, this week, morning. opening this morning. You were invited to go by, and uh, I look around the room and I see a lot of uh, familiar faces. Uh, I look out there and I see John Hurd, who, of course, many of you know, a medical doctor from DeKalb County, who. Uh, has been my friend ever since the beginning of my public career. And I think you also know that he's been a very active in the Republican Party. And when I started my campaign, he was one of the very first people that stepped forward and said he would help me and came to all the early meetings. And I'm so indebted to him. I appreciate him so very much. Uh, Jack Barnett, Jack, I hope I'm not going to hurt you, but uh, I want to thank you for your friendship. 
also very active in the Republican Party, but has been my friend and supporter. And uh, so many others in here that, uh, whose, whose uh, support I appreciate. Uh, my brother-in-law, Emmett Barnes, is here, and Byron Attridge, his father-in-law, they're both here, and I appreciate them so much. Uh, I was in the dark coming out here. I saw this Howard sticker. I said, well, now there's a guy with good judgment. I pulled up, it was my brother-in-law, so well. <laughs> well. It's nice of him to keep the sticker on. <laughs> Emmett, we thought we were going to be able to change the sticker, but it looks like the same one will do. <laughs> When I was leaving last year, you know, uh, I wondered how the group had reacted to my speech. I heard one fellow say, well, it's going to be a cold day before they invite him back. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cold day, all right. <laughs> now, I was honored to be your first speaker, and I'm delighted to see that things have gone so well for you, because as I told you last year, I'm a big believer in... Uh, in having this kind of organization. I remember when Paul Coverdale uh, was in the Senate, he and I worked on many things together, I, I think he would admit. And um, one of the things that, uh, that we noted back in those days when we felt that uh, there were some Democrats and some Republicans who felt very much the same way on a lot of issues, and uh, we felt that we were kind of fighting the old county unit mentality and, and uh, particularly in budgetary matters, we were always concerned that we didn't have the information. And we, we, had, we had what we thought were strong arguments, but it was difficult for us to obtain the data and the information to back them up. And um, that's when, when Paul got interested in, uh, in founding uh, a think tank for Metro issues. And uh, that has been a very successful uh, endeavor. This organization, I think, will continue to provide uh, and serve a very useful purpose for the state and for people like me and others in state government, others interested in state government, who um, really need uh, the resources that can be provided by a think tank sort of operation. Because someone who is concentrating on the public policy uh, aspects of questions on a daily and weekly basis uh, can get into it in a lot more depth and can really help us to understand the issues uh, with all of their shades of meaning. So this is a, a, a great organization and I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. I think you remember from last year that some of you were here for my speech last year and uh, you probably remember some of the themes that I that I touched on at that time. One of them I want to, a couple of them I want to revisit briefly, just to kind of give this some continuity. Uh, you, you remember from last year that I said that one of the things that I really believe about Georgia politics, as has been proven by the elections of recent years, is that Georgia voters are more apt today to vote for the person than they are to vote for the party. And I think, I'd be bold enough to say, I think that goes for the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Um, I pointed out to you last year that I was fortunate enough to carry Gwinnett County, which is thought to be a Republican county and certainly leans heavily Republican. But uh, voters in Georgia today are more concerned with what the person stands for and I think are more apt to to pass by the party label and look beyond that. So I think that's a, a trend that is here to stay, and I think it's a good trend for Georgia. I think it also means that both sides are going to have to, uh, to work harder to make sure they come up with uh, good sound ideas. They can't rely any longer uh, on being elected by straight party voting, even though there's always going to be an element of that. On both sides, you're going to have People who just simply, you know, people have told me, well, I just can't support you because you're a Democrat. I think you're a pretty good man, but you've got the wrong label behind your name. There's always going to be some of that, and there are going to be some Democrats who will say the same thing about Republicans, but in the main, um, the power has shifted away from that kind of thinking. And we have tried in the Senate to reflect th that desire of the people of this state to see both sides working together. 
I think, um, you know, the president uh, has gotten a lot of criticism, um, but I think the highest marks that he has received perhaps have been for NAFTA. And I think the reason that there was a good feeling about NAFTA was there was a coming together of both sides in Washington. And we have been so um, uh, disappointed for so long about the gridlock in Washington. We won't get into whose fault it is because I think, you know, there's plenty of fault to go around. But the point being that I think people want to see us trying to work together, uh, realizing that we're Americans first and Democrats and Republicans second. We're Georgians first, Democrats and Republicans second. And so in our small way in the Senate, we have tried to address that problem by making the Senate a place where uh, everyone, regardless of their party, feels a part of the process, is, a is actually a part of the process, and where ideas can be honestly and forthrightly debated, uh, where new ideas are welcome, they're not, uh, we're not impervious to uh, new ideas, and I hope to some degree we have accomplished that. I have appointed two Republican chairs now, chairman, um, Senator Mike Egan and Senator Jim Tysinger are now sitting in committee chairs, and Skin Edge was a committee chair before he was elected the minority leader. Uh, we have Republican senators in the continuation committee of the budget, and on, on my personal inner circle, I always consult with uh, members of the Republican caucus on important matters. And I've been working very closely with Johnny Isaacson on some legislation that I'm going to put forward this coming week on nursing homes. So I, I hope that we have begun to move in that direction. I think that's what you want. I think that's what the people want. A few of the initiatives that uh, Whit Ayers has done some great polling, and uh, I've seen that, and uh, it reflects exactly what we talked about last year, that 70, high 70s, uh, maybe low 80s in Georgia want uh, term limits. We passed the term limit proposal in the, in the Senate, and it's languishing over in the House. They seem to have a languishing area over there where a lot of things languish. They also, uh, we passed the uh, bill last year that requires a two-thirds majority for a tax increase, and it's languishing over in the House. And uh, I would suggest to you that it would be a good project of the Public Policy Foundation members to let it be known if indeed you agree that those bills need no longer language. They should be acted on this year. And then the, the voters could uh, decide if they want term limits. So we, uh, we always live in hope about those things, and we continue to push them, and, and uh, perhaps we can get them passed. I want to talk to you this morning about, about two things in, in general uh, terms. One is crime, and one is the, uh, the family. You know, for years, uh, we had a theory in Georgia that, uh, it, that we could rehabilitate all criminals. And we, uh, we, we had the phrase in common usage that jails were built for rehabilitation and not for revenge and all of that. As time has gone by, however, the, uh, the fallacy of our approach has become self-evident. At the Eggs and Issues breakfast uh, recently, I quoted a column from Dick Williams that I would commend to you. I can't, uh, I hope I'll be quoting him accurately because I don't have it before me, but Dick's uh, thesis was that based on the Heritage Foundation study, the Heritage Foundation uh, basically says that there is a small group of violent people in America who are committing 80% of the crime. And that uh, the way to attack the problem um, well, one, one of the main ways to attack the problem in the short term is to require violent criminals to serve longer sentences, to serve more of their sentence. And the thesis of the Heritage Foundation was that if violent criminals would serve at least 85% of their sentences all over America, that it would reduce crime by two-thirds. Because uh, when, you, when you realize that the recidivism rate is 60% or higher for violent criminals, and, and you realize that uh, we're recycling these people over and over through the uh, criminal justice system, then pretty soon it dawns on you that if you would just keep those violent people in for a longer period of time, 
that you would reduce crime. Now some people say, well, that's gonna cost too much money. My question to you is, what is it costing us not to do that? How much does it cost society to put a burglar or a, an armed robber back out on the street and have that person go right back into doing the same thing? There have been estimates that uh, each one of these people uh, can steal up to half a million dollars or whatever the, you know, let's say it's $100,000 before they get caught again. My personal feeling is it would probably be higher than that. There's a certain, uh, there's a certain uh, willingness of these people to take a risk because in this same uh, article, Dick Williams pointed out that only 1.2% of the burglars ever serve any time. Uh, a pretty uh, high percentage of those who are arrested go to jail, but it's a matter of catching them. And so that gets down to uh, you know, the question of how, what are we gonna do about more policemen and all the rest. But I think that in the short term, that we need to move forward on the governor's proposal for harsher uh, penalties for violent offenders and uh, to require them to serve all of their sentence for violent crimes on the first offense. And on the second offense, if, if they commit a second violent felony, they're in there for good. They're out of here, they're out of our way, they're out of society's way. You give them one chance to rehabilitate themselves. If they go back to another violent crime, then they're out of here. So that, that's what I think we need to do. Now, I'm well aware that that is not gonna solve the whole crime problem. We know that. And um, I read the paper this morning, I made a proposal on uh, carjacking. And uh, it was, uh, one of the local newspapers stated that I, that I was overreacting and pandering uh, by trying to create a separate crime for carjacking. Well, let me tell you something. I don't, I don't think that anybody in this room believes that trying to do something about the number one problem in our state is an overreaction. It's about time that we had some kind of a strong reaction to it because in every poll that they take, black Democrats, white Democrats, white Republicans, the number one concern of all of these groups is the same. And if you read Witt's, uh, and, and crime is of course the concern, if you read Witt Ayer's uh, poll, the group it has the largest percentage of those who say that's their top concern are black Democrats. Because uh, in the black community, the crime problem is even more acute than it is in our communities. And um, that is something that is being reflected in the polls. And if you talk to the black leaders in the state senate, um, they are very supportive uh, of, of what we are about here, and that is trying to get violent criminals off the street. So I would solicit your support for what we're trying to do. We have built the jails. Georgia is in a position to carry forward with this program because we have just built six jails. We've opened more hard beds uh, in the last uh, three years than ever in the history of the state. So we are poised to carry forward with this uh, new approach if the legislature will approve it. Another thing that I want to point out to you that, that I think uh, is worthy of our attention is the general condition of the family in Georgia. I've been dealing a lot in the past year with the child abuse problem and of course uh, we are taking steps which we hope will set us on the right course to doing something about that. But just about every problem that we look at poor education, results, um, crime, all of the social problems, welfare, all of these things get back down to one thing and that is the breakdown of the family in America. When I was a, a young man, it was a rare thing in Decatur to have a divorce. Today it is sort of the standard procedure. And while uh, so many have touted the liberation of adults as the standard of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the liberation of the adults, the liberation of the adults has left in its wake a lot of children who have been harmed as a result of it. I think we need to rethink that. 
I think that um, we need to look at our divorce laws and, and we probably need to uh, require counseling for any couple that wants to have a divorce that, who has children so that they will understand going into it what the effect is going to be and if they must go forward with the divorce, which I realize that that's part of life, but uh, there are ways to handle it in a way that will minimize the effects on children. So I think that's one thing that we need to start thinking about. I don't have an answer this morning to it, but we need to start looking at that. We also need to uh, be aware that 30% of the children in this state are being born out of wedlock. And it's time that uh, all of us stood up and said that there's something fundamentally wrong with that. We have, got to, uh, we have got to understand that the, the family unit is the pillar upon which this uh, society was built. And uh, when you've got a society in which 30% of the children are being born out of wedlock, you cannot have anything but a deterioration. 18,000 families in Georgia are on welfare because of a failure to pay child support. And that's the reason that we have introduced legislation at this session to uh, give us another lever in the collection of child support to uh, take away the business licenses of those who are behind. Now that includes some 400,000 people in the state who hold business licenses. You see, you can go out here and uh, take action against uh, a wage earner by garnishing his wages. But if you've got someone who's self-employed, who's not paying his child support, it's very hard to get, uh, get a hammer. So uh, we're going to do what some other states have done, and that is to uh, move in if they're behind on their child support and tell them that if they don't get current, we're going to take away their business license. And uh, we have got to get serious about requiring fathers and mothers who are non-custodial parents to support their children. When you've got 18,000 families, in this state on welfare because of that problem, then that is affecting each and every one of you in, in the amount of taxes you pay. So we're going to, uh, we're going to work on that. Recently, uh, I wrote a letter to Georgia Public Television. And I realized that by doing this, you're wading into some very deep water. Uh, but what had happened was the principal of our high school, John, out in Decatur, you know him, had written me a letter, Carl Renfro, about some programs that were appearing on Georgia Public Television. I don't know if any of you saw the programming. But uh, it included uh, uh, show, graphic d portrayal of drug use, graphic, uh, uh, rather graphic portrayal of uh, sexual themes, uh, some very, very, uh, objectionable language. And this was on Georgia Public Television. And it just struck me that one of the problems that we've got in this country is that children who will see 18,000 hours of television by the time they average, by the time they get out of high school, are being bombarded with uh, violence and sex and bad language. You turn on MTV, you turn on any of this, and you'll see it. And I realize that anybody can turn off their TV. They don't have to watch it. I understand that. But I also believe that where a channel is promoted and sponsored 42% by the taxpayers, that we have some responsibility as the leaders of the state to make sure that the programming uh, does not go beyond certain bounds. And somebody asked me yesterday, where do you draw the line? Well, I'm not a censor. And I'm not running Georgia Public Television. But I do know, it's kind of like the uh, Supreme Court Justice that said, I, don't, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. I think that most of the people in Georgia who watch Georgia Public Television expect that television channel to adhere to a little higher standards. And they would like for it to be a channel that uh, the family can watch, one that they can uh, entrust for their children to watch and not have to be monitoring everything when they're the ones paying half the bill. So I have written a letter to Mr. Ottinger um,
telling him that I thought it was poor judgment to run this particular program and asking him in the future to exercise better judgment. We hope that will bring about uh, some kind of a, a review of their policy. But uh, my point to you, I guess, in telling you all this is I think that at some point, without being the censors for the world, we, we, we uh, don't look at ourselves that way at all, but at some point you've got to stand up and make a beginning. And if you can't make a beginning with the public television station that is funded by the taxpayers, then I don't know where you do begin. So uh, we, we, have, we have done that in, in recent days. A few of the other things that I'm very interested in uh, this session are a package of bills that will give, we hope, the lottery a little bit more accountability. Uh, I'll be introducing those at the first of the week. One of them would uh, require monthly accounting reports to the legislature of the lottery revenues that are coming in so we'll know what's coming in. Right now we get an anecdotal evidence in the newspapers about it. Um, we want to change the bidding process so that uh, we'll have some kind of a pre-qualification uh, process for bidders. You remember uh, one, of the, one of the big contracts was given out and the low bidder didn't get it. You remember the uh, controversy that followed that. What we would like to have is a pre-qualification process so that uh, the, the, the bidders, eventual bidders, are determined to be pre-qualified and then the lowest bidder can, can be given the contract by law. Another thing that we are interested in is uh, looking at those programs that the lottery is funding. We're funding some good programs in the lottery. One is the Hope Scholarship Program. One is the uh, pre-kindergarten program to, for high-risk children to get them ready for school. And the other is the technology for the schools in Georgia. We're very far behind on that. So they're all good programs. My question is, what are those going to cost in the long run? And when the lottery funds drop, how much uh, of the general funds are going to have to be spent to support those programs. I think we need to know, know that now rather than later so we'll know what we're getting into. So we're going to ask for a, the formulation of a strategic five-year estimate of net lottery proceeds along with an itemization of the projected cost of these programs over the next five years to try to get a handle on where exactly where we are. And then we're going to have legislation to require the Office of Planning and Budget to prepare and include in the bu budget document a list of all projects and programs applying for lottery funds. So we'll, we'll know who is asking for the money and who is getting it. Another area that uh, I want to mention to you that I think uh, has got to be a concern of everyone in this room is drunken driving. Uh, I realize that uh, times have changed and mores have changed and uh, we take a very different view of drunken driving perhaps than we did 20 years ago, which I think is timely and important. Last year, we lost uh, 17,000 people in this country as a result of drunken driving. And it is my belief that uh, until the legislature makes a strong policy to uh, send out the message to the people of the state that we have changed our attitudes about drunk driving, that we're not going to really be able to move forward too much on, uh, on, on stopping it. Because if, if a person knows that the first time they go out there and get arrested, that all they've got to do is get a lawyer and pay a fee and they get their license right back, then it's not very much of an incentive not to engage in that conduct. So what we're going to do is uh, try once again, as we did last year, to uh, eliminate the Noel contendery plea. This is a fairly radical step, but I think it is a step that is timely and needed uh, so that uh, the first offender cannot get one free bite at the apple. I realize that many people are not going to like this approach, but I do think that it is the right approach after giving it a lot of thought. We passed this in the Senate last year. Uh, it is languishing in the House um, over there. We also passed a bill last year to um, prohibit employees of nightclubs and other establishments that sell alcohol from drinking on the job. You remember that we had one uh, waitress who got off work on Northside Drive at a certain establishment there, and she had been drinking all night. She went up the expressway and killed a little girl crossing the street. We passed that in the Senate, and it, it is languishing in the House at this time. Uh, we are going to uh, have a bill to take care of the situation that came up when Officer Chris McGill was killed by a drunken driver in Gwinnett County. You remember he was out working and uh, he was on the DUI task force. He was run into and killed by a drunken driver. 
he had some 200 cases pending. And because he is not around to testify, uh, those cases have either had to be uh, pled down or pled out or whatever preposition you want to use or dismissed. So uh, we're going to have a bill to permit the uh, videotaped evidence that the officer takes to be admissible in court without his presence uh, so that this will not happen in the future. We also uh, are establishing zero tolerance for underage drunk drivers. That is to say that if you have a person under 21 who, for whom it is illegal in Georgia to purchase alcohol, that we do not believe that we should tolerate any level of alcohol in the blood of those individuals if they're on the road because they're not supposed to buy it to begin with. So uh, we've got that bill in the hopper, or it's been introduced. We also um, are going to change our approach in terms of how long your record um, would stand with a DUI on it and not have it come off. You know, right now you, you have a five-year period, and if you, if you don't get a DUI for five years, then your record is expunged and you start over. What we want to do is say that the DUI arrest stays on there forever. Because why should, uh, why should the judge not know in the sixth year that you had one back five years, six years ago? Why should he not know that? Now, these, these, are, these are tough bills. And uh, it's pretty strong medicine. But I think when you're losing 17,000 people a year that we, we need some tough medicine and we need some strong medicine. We're going to continue with our efforts to uh, attack the crime problem from the roots. And uh, we know that you've got to have the short-term solution. We've already talked about that. We need more policemen on the street, tougher penalties for the violent. But we also need to start working with abused children at the beginning. And I went to DeKalb Medical Center yesterday, John, to kick off their Healthy Families program. It's a program that uh, screens all of the babies that come in. They uh, are able to pick the at-risk families from that model, and then they uh, on a voluntary basis, they work with the families at risk. They've had very good success in getting acceptance. They work with them on parenting skills. Uh, they work with them on appropriate discipline. They work with them on, uh, on health issues. And they've been very, very successful in preventing abuse. I talked to a little girl yesterday who was there. She's 16. She had a baby. And her husband, her first husband, was in jail because he had abused their first child which she had when she was only 14. Of course, she's not equipped to deal with it. He put the baby in some uh, very, very hot water and burned the baby. Uh, the baby did recover and uh, had minimal scarring, but he, this, the husband was put in jail for eight years, and the little girl is left uh, with the two children. So this, uh, this program is helping her, and she was telling me how much it had really helped her, and uh, she's married again now, and things are going better for her. But there was a situation that the, the program could turn around. So these prevention programs will work if they're properly approached. And we believe that that is part of the answer to the crime problem. It's the long-term answer. The short-term answer is something uh, else. I want you to know that, uh, that I have tried hard. I, I know that I haven't succeeded in every instance, but I've tried hard to bring the attitude of more efficiency in government. I know that that is a very important part of what we do. I know that uh, we can always do better. I would tell you that we have returned $1.5 million to the state treasury from the lieutenant governor's office since January 1991. Senate employment levels have been reduced 20% through attrition. And for example, we had 34 secretaries serving 56 senators. Now we have 22. That's about a 350 thousand dollar savings to the taxpayers. We believe in our office that this can be done throughout state government. We have tried hard to get an overall attrition approach uh, studied. We put the money in the budget. We have not gotten a whole lot of reaction out of the Office of Planning and Budget on that uh, idea, even though the money is there to study the idea. But I think that if we can reduce the number of our employees overall in the Senate, that we can do it everywhere in state government through attrition. Um, some people think that it would save 
uh, as much as $200 million a year if we could get the number of state employees in Georgia down to the national average. And, and I believe that it could be done within about three years through attrition because we have about a 10 to 15 percent attrition rate. And just get rid of the employees that are non-essential. But we, uh, we're going to continue to push that. And I think that uh, with the help of people like you, that we can turn the corner in Georgia, that we can have a more efficient government, that we can have a government that lives within its means and that answers the needs. You know, I'm interested in answering the needs. I'm interested in better education, better schools, better health care, and all of that. But I don't think that we have made the case to the Georgia people that we can manage the money to the extent that we need to. And, and that is uppermost in my mind. We are trying hard to regain their confidence and their trust. And I think that when, when the taxpayers see us actively trying to do what we can to eliminate waste, to make sure that every job is needed and that every job is pro providing a needed function, then I think that we will be able to restore public confidence. I think when they see us trying to get people off of welfare and get them into uh, meaningful jobs, like the PEACH program that was mentioned earlier, that Tom mentioned, that we have gotten hundreds and hundreds of people off of welfare and into private sector jobs, not make work jobs in government, but private sector jobs. That's the kind of thing people want to see the government doing. So we're trying to move in that direction. And I hope that, uh, I know that there's some people in here probably going to be elected to the legislature at the next election. I know one right back there that uh, is trying to do that, a good friend of mine. And uh, I want to encourage you, whatever your level of interest, to get more involved. Coming to this breakfast is a good start. I know that some of you are going to be vitally involved in the campaigns. And I really, uh, I'm delighted that Tom is not managing my opponent's campaign. I, I think that's great. And I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that, uh, let's see, I was looking for him. I don't see him. I'm glad, I'm glad that uh, so far I don't have an opponent. But uh, <laughs> I realize I probably am going to at some point. But I want to just tell you that uh, regardless of what happens in the election, that, uh, that I'm feeling good about my situation, that uh, I'm looking forward to this year. I'm, I'm realizing that I have one year left on my contract. And uh, I realize that uh, I may or may not get reelected. But if I do have that opportunity, then I'm going to dedicate myself for the next term to the same things that I've been trying to do in this term, the same things that I've talked about try to continue the work of making the Senate a place that you can be proud of and trying to make the Georgia government a government that you feel good about. Thank you for the opportunity of being here, and I look forward to coming next year if, in fact, I'm still in public office. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Other than contacting uh, our representatives of the media, obviously, uh, uh, one of the things that occurs to me is we don't know how maybe to attack the languishing problem if we don't know what the bills are that are languishing. How can we easily find out what some of those bills are? And furthermore, would it be uh, effective for an organization like this to become more familiar with some of those bills and as, as, as this group represents it? Yes, sir. I think so. I, I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, that's the strength of a group like this. And there's strength in numbers, and uh, the Public Policy Foundation, I think, has uh, grown in stature over over the last year because more people are aware now of it. And you know, these breakfasts I think have helped with a lot of the. Um, state elected officials coming and seeing what's here and the type of individuals who attend these breakfasts. Um, it would be easy for me to provide to Griff uh, a list of the languishing bills. I'll do that right away and he can communicate to you and I would hope that uh, if you agree that some of these bills need to to be freed over there 
and uh, voted on, just let the House vote. Let them have a chance to vote on it. If they voted up or down, fine, but let, let's let them vote. And, um, and just, just urge that, you know, urge the bills uh, to come to the floor and have a chance to be voted on before the election so everybody will know where everybody stands, and then we can have a discussion about it during the summer. But I think if we urge that, that we, we ought to have some luck. Uh, because uh, I know that uh, Chairman Lee probably is going to want to let the uh, term limit bill be voted on, give everybody a chance to record their vote on that. He's got that bill and so forth. And we can, we can give you the uh, names of the bills and the subject matter and where they are. Who's chairman, uh, who's the chairman of what committee? Yes, ma'am. That's right. That's, uh, her point is that if, if there's objectionable programming, that you can write to the sponsors, and that's always a certainly a good way to do it. Jack, uh, I, I saw a television program about <laughs> Yes, sir. We we uh, we have been <clears throat> continuously concerned about error rates. Uh, there are two there are two problems. One is the fraud that was referred to, and I saw that same program. One, one is the fraud, where people are trafficking in these tickets and exchanging them for <coughs> various commodities that are not food. And the other problem is about the, the, the approximately 8% error rate. Now part of, um, you know, you can always make apologies and excuses for why things are as they are, but part of the reason uh, for the error rate is the guidelines are so complex. It's a book this thick. It's easy to make a mistake. And some of the errors are made in, in whether someone is eligible or not, and saying someone's eligible when they're not, and then not, not finding out when they lose their eligibility but continue to get the stamps even though they have technically lost eligibility. So we are, we are trying to develop better systems um, to deal with that so that we will make fewer errors. We also have an error rate in uh, AFDC or welfare, same thing. It's the same, basically the same problem. And, and getting and, and training the people better who are doing it, getting the right people. And there, of course, in recent years, there's been a tremendous stress and strain on these, these agencies that hand out these uh, benefits because of the economy to some degree has, has caused the demand to go up. But it is a very, very serious problem for Georgia because the error rate triggers penalties from Washington. So if you don't get your error rate down within acceptable, le acceptable levels, not only are you losing the tax money from that, but you're paying these penalties. So it's something that it needs to be given attention, and we are dealing, trying to deal with it. It's a tough, tough problem. Who authored that book? Uh, Georgia uh, bureaucrats? Or? No, these were, these were the Washington, the ex real experts, the Washington variety. <laughs> now, they, they sell them by the pound up there, I think. Anybody else? Okay, that, what he's, he's referring to is the, uh, the, just the very nature of the Lieutenant Governor's Office and the fact that I'm uh, employed by Austin and Byrd. Let me, let me get into that a little bit. I'd be glad to. Um, the Lieutenant Governor's job in Georgia was conceived by some legislator back in the 40s, and they put it in the Constitution when Ellis Arnold was governor. We had our, I'm only the ninth person to hold the office. Um, back in the beginning, um, the idea was that the lieutenant governor would preside over the Senate and, um, for three months and then would pretty much go back to wherever it was he was from and do whatever it was he was doing before he got elected. And that's the way it went for a while. Marvin Griffin was one and then you had Ernest Vandiver. He had a law practice in Livonia and, uh, and, and so forth and so on. At Lester Maddox, you know, sold ax handles. And we, we had all different different varieties of endeavors that were done. Zell Miller wrote books. He taught at Emory. He, uh, 
He bought a radio station. He formed a bank. So um, lieutenant governors have, have certainly had outside business interests, every one of them. What I was, I'm just going to tell you the unvarnished truth about it. What I thought when I got into this was that I was going to have a full, one four-year term as lieutenant governor and that um, if things went well that I might be able to make a run for governor. If I won, I'd be the governor. If I didn't win, I'd be out and back to uh, working full time at, in the private sector. But uh, so, so I sold my law practice. When I got elected, I sold my law practice. Had a contract with the firm to pay me the money, 20 years of work, clients, work in progress, collectibles, all of that. Well, the firm went uh, belly up after two years. It, it, the firm was the ninth largest firm in the city, and I don't know that anyone could have predicted such a thing would happen, but it happened. So uh, I was left with the choice of either to sue my law partners for the balance of it, which I wouldn't do, or to make other arrangements. Because uh, when I went into this, I went into it with the idea that if I sold my law practice, that it would sustain me for four years, and I would, you know, I would be fine until until that term was over. But uh, so I had a choice to make, and my choice was whether to get out of politics, which certainly, uh, you know, some people would probably hope I would. Uh, or to try to make some kind of a, an accommodation so that I could perform a lieutenant governor's job and support my family and pay my bills, which I'm sure you want the lieutenant governor to be paying his bills, pay my taxes, my city taxes and Fulton County taxes and state taxes and federal taxes. <laughs> and uh, I think you're, you're probably sympathetic with the fact that a fellow who makes uh, $60,000 a year as lieutenant governor winds up with $35,000 to spend, and uh, you know, when the kids need braces and so forth, I mean, I think that everybody in this room can understand that. Now, the question beyond that is, uh, what should the lieutenant governor do about the part-time status? Um, the job has evolved into a job where the demands are year-round. It's not that you're performing an official function Year round, but you you know year round you're asked to do things like this, which I think are important. I mean I think it's important for the lieutenant governor to get out and say what's on his mind for people to be able to ask questions. So uh, I constantly uh, feel that I need to go and, and accept some of the speeches. A lot of them are at night, a lot of them are in the morning, a lot of them are at noon. So that leaves you some time uh, to perform uh, whatever work you have to do. So what I'm planning to do is to uh, I don't believe that anybody will miss uh, me anywhere because I think I can still do what I do in the off season with careful planning and spend time working at the law firm. Now at the law firm what I plan to do is work in very narrow areas which will not present a conflict of interest. And uh, I'm going to do a lot of dispute resolution I hope. Uh, that's one of the things that we've talked about. Work with some of the young associates on their litigation skills. and. Um, find other areas within that firm which will per permit me to perform valuable services to them without getting into a conflict of interest. As far as, as making the, the office a more part-time office, we have scaled it down. We plan on scaling it down further. And uh, what I believe that we should do is have fewer people, I believe in paying the ones I've got, a living wage. And I have raised some salaries which I make no apology for, but I have got fewer people. So overall, it's a big savings to the taxpayers. Uh, we, uh, we have, we have uh, as I said, reduced employment 20%, which is an enormous uh, savings overall to the taxpayers, even though some of the people are making more than they did before. Thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed it. I, I want you to know that uh, if you disagree with me, I want to hear from you. If you agree with me, I appreciate it and I look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank you.